Good day, everyone. Welcome to the next in a series of roundtable discussions focused on the direct view LED market. In our last event, we focused on the design considerations for LED. In today's discussion, we will cover the use of video, of video windows uh, on your LED wall. Before we start, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, please use the chat feature to let us know where you're connecting to uh, from today. We'd love to hear from you. Also, we ask that you post your questions in the Q&A section uh, and only in the Q&A section. This will give our guests the opportunity to see them in real time, and then they'll be able to uh, respond with answers either by responding to your question in writing or by answering it in the Q&A session later on in the event. To start off, uh, I'm Fred Kane with Absin. Uh, I'm the Industrial Development Director for the Consultant Community. Uh, my role is uh, to provide support to consultants and system specifiers, uh, mostly in the US. I have over uh, 35 years uh, in the pro AV market with positions in rental staging, uh, systems integration, consultant, and finally 10 years with industry leading manufacturers like Absin. Joining us today is a great group of panelists. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, let's start uh, today with uh, uh, Christian. Christian, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. So sorry, but uh, at the moment I can't open the video. Well, anyhow, so you, uh, I think you uh, can hear my voice, right? Correct, I can hear you. J uh, Jason, can you uh, unmute uh, yeah, the camera? There, there I am. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so uh, let me shortly introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Christian Chimney, so uh, my last name is a bit complicated written, but uh, uh, pronounced like uh, chimney, like the chimney sweep. And um, I'm in the industry now since almost 25 years, and uh, I joined Epson now since three years. So I'm working as the industry product director within Epson. And uh, I, to, to make a, a long uh, rule uh, short, I'm the interface between uh, the, the, you know, the market and customers and our technical departments within headquarters. So this point out very well uh, my rule within Epson. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's turn now to uh, Scott Norder from RGB Spectrum, Scott. Hey, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Scott Norder. I'm the Chief Operating <coughs> Officer of RGB Spectrum. RGB Spectrum is a company that builds, markets, video, video wall processing, which, you know, fortunately is a so topic for today. Uh, we have built solutions for the last 34 years for the certain customers to get video where it needs to be, uh, primarily for high value decision making. I personally have been in the industry as well for 20 years, uh, started my career in this industry at AMX, and I'm pleased to be here to talk to you about video walls. Great, great, thank you. I didn't know you were at AMX, that's great. <laughs> um, and then finally, we have Jason Kartak, who is a senior consultant with uh, Threshold Acoustics in Chicago. Hey everybody, I'm Jason. I'm from Threshold Acoustics, as uh, Fred mentioned. I've been in the industry over 25 years. Uh, most of my career has been in the uh, performing arts or performance-based uh, designing and spectrum, uh, but I've also been a touring engineer uh, for over 25 years as well. Uh, so I've been heavily involved in the uh, industry from uh, performing arts spaces to uh, higher education as well. Terrific, terrific. Uh, all right, so uh, that, excellent. Thanks, welcome guys. Uh, we're glad to have you on our call today. Some of the things that I get asked about uh, as I talk to consultants and other people in the industry are, are you know, how does an LED wall work? Uh, how do you get so many different uh, video images on screen at the same time? And, you know, also I get asked, you know, why are there so many wires going to an LED wall? Um, so we're gonna answer these questions for you all today. Uh, let's begin with uh, Christian. Uh, Christian, um, I'm walking into a conference room, I'm ready to get, uh, my image up on screen. Uh, how does my laptop signal get to the LED wall? Is, is there some kind of splitter or controller device? Yeah, so uh, there is a controller. So usually called LED controller uh, or uh, for the, the Chinese uh, colleagues, they are more familiar with the term of sending card. Uh, and this gives you already an indication what we speak about. So it's a kind of uh, yeah, interface 
uh, converter actually, uh, which uh, convert your computer signal, doesn't matter, HDMI, DVI, uh, video, what else. Uh, it converts it to, let's say, unique protocol of an LED screen. And uh, it, it use uh, then finally a CAT5 cable and, and the common RJ45 connector. But that doesn't mean that it's a TCP IP uh, protocol. So that's also important to, to know. Uh, so means you can't use IT structure. Uh, so through distribution of a router or switcher. So even though we speak about uh, such kind of cable, uh, as uh, I said, is very unique uh, converter. Uh, and, and that's how an LED screen do work. It do need its uh, LED language uh, to, to uh, yeah, show you the according picture in a good quality with the right bit, bit depth and so on. So um, tell us more about an LED video wall. I mean, what are the things that most people don't know to plan for? Yeah, so so let me continue with the with the cabling. So um, we, as a manufacturer, take care about a, a wire diagram, and uh, there is a reason for because there are several rules behind what I mentioned just before. Uh, so starting with the maximum ca cable capacity. Uh, so roughly, uh, just to give you an idea, it's one fourth of an HD signal. So about 500,000 pixels uh, that can be handled by one uh, wire, by one cable. And uh, so that need to be known. And uh, what then I can continue that topic. So you need to know whether it makes sense to go horizontally, vertically. Uh, then uh, if I make another example, if we speak about an uh, HD screen with a pixel pitch resolution or pixel pitch of 1.5, still HD resolution, then we speak about five by five panels, which uh, is the, the, the screen. And that means, uh, okay, so how many cables? Uh, the bandwidth uh, would be enough for five, uh, uh, for for five or even more of those panels, but uh, we just have four outputs at, at a controller. Uh, so it means uh, also uh, there need to be consideration of number of uh, output data outputs of a controller, which is four, typically four or multiple four, depend on which kind of controller. Then uh, let me continue with the cable uh, distance needed. So. Uh, there are two, basically two options. So sometimes we do have a controller, such LED controller in a control room or uh, very visible over there. And, uh, or we do have an, a kind of invisible uh, integrated in the screen uh, already. Uh, that means uh, we just need to provide HDMI signal over there. But uh, such special cable, if we speak about control room uh, situation, uh, has a maximum length of uh, 75 between 75 and 100 meter uh, of such data cable. So, um, and then we need to speak about uh, data redundancy uh, and also, uh, let's say, uh, to bring it to the uh, end of cabling uh, and consideration for an LED screen, power cabling, uh, whether it's going the same direction or uh, vertical data and horizontally power. Uh, it needs to be carefully considered uh, because uh, otherwise you have a bigger area without picture in case uh, you do have a failure. So uh, those are what, the things that get in my mind, just to mention uh, cabling in, uh, at an LED screen. So <clears throat> at Appsin, we supply the wiring diagram. So, so you, we would make those decisions for the customer and for the integrator so they would know the proper or the recommended uh, technique for running those wires. Yeah, and uh, so so that should be followed. And uh, so the ve very experienced people in the market know how to uh, yeah, how to reconfigure or do their own uh, design. But basically, <laughs> makes more, much more sense uh, uh, much more sense to follow that wire diagram. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So, so the controller takes my laptop and it puts it on the screen. Um, what if they're not the same resolution? Does it does it fill the screen? Yeah. So there is a yes and a no. <laughs> 
So it really depends on uh, the device. So uh, usually uh, to, yeah, to, to make it uh, first of all easy, uh, this converter, which we mentioned at the beginning, uh, so simply uh, makes a pixel in, pixel out. So uh, that means it doesn't scale uh, and it, it doesn't uh, yeah, automatically uh, fit your, uh, your resolution of the computer to the LED screen. Uh, but uh, there is an exception if we speak about our product uh, called uh, Apps Nikon, which is an so-called all-in-one. There we do have the function that it uh, gets uh, converted kind of on, uh, to the same size and uh, yeah, that, so therefore there is a yes and a no. And, uh, and there are also, uh, as every manufacturer usually, usually do have uh, different options uh, for such LED controller, uh, there are also options to have scaling uh, and also multiple, uh, multiple inputs and so on. So, um, it's, it's a question of uh, yeah the uh, to speak uh, about in advance and to configure. So so what you're saying is that the the normal controller, which is in our case either a Nova Star processor or a Brompton processor, depending, um, the normal controller has a single input, but some have more than one. Uh, and and now how many are on the app? Apps and Icon is uh, our all-in-one uh, LED wall solution available in 110, 138, or 165 inches. So how many inputs can, can that uh, unit take? So you, it can show four inputs at the same time, uh, but it has kind of more uh, signal in, uh, inputs. So uh, we do have uh, three times HDMI 2.0, uh, we do have uh, Wi-Fi uh, input. Uh, we also do have USB ports uh, where you can uh, recall videos and pictures from. So uh, there are uh, in total kind of more than four signal sources, but uh, this apps and icon can just show four, which is uh, yeah what, what we learned just uh, just now, which is already kind of uh, advanced uh, function because usually there is only one. Okay, so um, what I'm hearing you say is that uh, uh, we've got the ability to get uh, more than one input on the screen, but uh, we don't have the dynamic capabilities of a full window processor. Um, so it, uh, let, let's talk to, let's, let's turn to Scott a little. After, before we turn to Scott, let's take our first poll. Um, we've got a poll we wanna put up here. We're, we wanna find out a little bit about your, uh, uh, your, your use of, of LED video walls. How many images do your customers want to see on the screen at the same time? Please uh, respond to the poll and uh, we'll uh, continue our, our discussion. So Scott, uh, let's turn to you to, to, to talk a little bit more about uh, multi-input controllers and processors. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. I think you know, the, the advent of direct view LED uh, has really been a great thing for, for our industry in general. Uh, you know, we certainly believe the more pixels that are out there to paint, the better it is. And providing flexibility to get the content you want onto a display is what video processing is all about. So windowing is one aspect of what customers may want to do. They may want to have multiple moving images on their display. But that's not the only thing that processing can give you. And it's through, through every processing company's product lines from small solutions to large solutions, you're going to find a range of features that provide additional benefit to the integrator as well as to the end customer. Uh, benefits like flexibility. So the more inputs you have on your processor, the more flexibility you have on the images that can go up on your display. And in fact, the processor then takes the place of what would traditionally have been an AD switch. Um, as, as Christian mentioned, the ability to have uh, 
internet connected content. And that could be streaming video directly from cameras, that could be VMS content from a video management server. Uh, it could be streaming content from a cloud-based service. Um, cu some customers in public spaces doing something like digital signage may wanna have some broadcast television content on their wall with other content. So, you know, there is a lot of flexibility when you look at having multiple windows on a display surface uh, that you get through deploying uh, uh, video wall processing technologies. And, and I think additionally, uh, being able to programmatically control the content that is on that display then gives you guys as integrators and consultants a greater degree of comfort that that display will present the information that you want it to present when you want it to present that information. So I think some of those are some of the key things that you get from, from benefits. And I think you may have also you know, been wondering, you know, what are the things that I should consider if I'm thinking about a wall processor implementation or a multi-viewer implementation with just a wall processor with a single output. Um, and, and I think you need to look at, first of all, what is the resolution of the ultimate display surface that you have? If it's a 2K display surface or a 4K display surface, and you consider how far back from the display surface your viewers will be, that'll give you a sense of how many images really make sense to put up on that display. A 2K resolution display should not have 32 images on it. That's really not gonna be an effective way to communicate image uh, information. Uh, the, 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 the scaling of all those images will produce a pretty poor result. Um, so you really wanna look at- So the let me stop you just ahead, for a second sir. there, Scott. Yeah. Um, let's, bring up, let's bring up our poll because I, I think we'll, we'll see some things here. So it looks like uh, the answers here is, is more than two is definitely a clear winner. So Scott, that goes directly to what you were just saying uh, about number of images up there. We don't want uh, 32 images on a screen, but we know our customers want more than two. Yeah. Now so, you could certainly put 32 images on a really wide array of direct view LED. And, and certainly some of our customers uh, who are building just these uh, tremendously large control rooms uh, in in uh, utilities and medical and military. Uh, you know they have some some pretty sophisticated multi-image walls. Uh, so certainly there are cases where thirty-two images make sense. But again, that is really one where there's plenty of resolution to make that happen. Right, right. So it, it is is one type of processor better than another? I mean, what? I really think it's a you know, in this day and age, customers have the opportunity to pick the right solution, which is a price and performance fit for them. If you want four images on your display surface and you want the flexibility to put them wherever, you want programmatic control, you can spend a few thousand dollars to get a multi-viewer that will give you all the functionality that you need with additional inputs, you know, up to seven or 10 inputs, depending on the solution you choose. Um, you can move up anybody's product lines to include features like uh, re-encoding portions of the wall for connectivity. And, and I think when you get into the top end of the scale where you have full robustness, you know, you're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars for all that robustness, which would be more inputs, more outputs, the ability to send content from the wall to other locations, the ability to control multiple wall surfaces simultaneously, auxiliary displays on the side can all be controlled from a single processor. But when you're up there, you're talking about a lot more money, but in a large implementation, it becomes very cost-effective to have a single processor do all that work. So I think there are really a, a great number of options for customers to choose from at the right price points today. Great, great. So just so we're, we're answering questions live. So if uh, you've got, got a question uh, and you want to go ahead and submit it in the Q&A section, uh, we'll be answering them as we go along uh, and then uh, discussing some of them at the end as well. So um, you mentioned network sources. Um, can all of your processors use network sources or, 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 or is there certain units that uh, have that connectivity and other stuff? Yes, yeah, so within our product line, uh, the Galileo uh, product line uh, supports 
a full range of network uh, sources natively within uh, our own product lines or Zeo product line uh, also supports the display of H.264 based sources from a wide variety of uh, uh, schemes, whether they're encoded devices, cameras, or web content. Um, those processors all support that natively, and it's it's a very popular feature. And that's great. The the uh, let's do our second poll because it relates directly to that. Uh, uh, Jason, are you prepared to bring up our second uh, our second poll? We'll, we'll keep talking until it comes up. Um, what are the challenges that we can run into um, as we design a system with a processor, or, or as we use it? I mean, uh, you know if. We're sitting in a in a room with a client, and they're telling us, "I want content distributed in this way," and then they, they change their mind later. I mean, what what are the, the you know what challenges exist once you put that in your system? Yeah, I, I think you you put your finger on one of the biggest ones, which is maintaining the system long term. Uh, we're uh, wall processing systems are built to be flexible; they can be reconfigured over time. You have the ability to add. Uh, input and output cards. If you're going to increase the size of your displays, you can add additional inputs from switching performance. You can increase your, the feature set by uh, additional licensing. But ultimately, one of the biggest issues is how the information is presented and how the users interact with that information. And I, I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, can happen in an installation is that lots of people get experience and they say, I want to set my own presets and, and then they clog up all the presets. So it be, then becomes difficult for some users to get the experience that they want. So I think maintenance is an issue that needs a lot of attention. Um, some of the systems are, are Windows based and, and as a result, you really want to be very careful about uh, Windows updates that could get to the Windows-based processors. Um, our processors use uh, a pretty locked down version of, of Windows 10 uh, Professional Edition. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a great solution, but it's not foolproof. And it is a Windows system. So someone can go into there, go into there and change some drivers that might cause problems with the walls. And you just have to be very careful that those, those uh, systems are segregated so that they don't randomly take updates from windows and, and those are all things they just have to pay attention to right not right. critical but you just got to pay attention so let's do we're ready for the poll now jason uh, there you go where do our sources come from are they coming from a local presenter are they rack located or is it a combination network sources so I, I while people are, are answering the poll i want to um Scott, let me ask you this question. This is coming in from our audience, um, coming from Corey Salvatore, who is a good friend of ours. Um, uh, how do you typically address redundancy for more uh, high vis or high reliability scenarios like Knox? Oh, thank you, Corey. That's a great question. Uh, ultimately, the, the best solution for redundancy is to take your sources, put them through a switch and or DA and get them into both devices and have them on standby and hooked up to the alternate inputs on every display. Um, that's a solution very few customers actually implement. Um, I, I think the next step back from there is to make sure that you have great power conditioning and battery backup for your systems, as well as hot swappable power supplies. If you can do that, I think you're going to find that uptime, up you know, reaches multiple levels of nines uh, for uh, important SOCs and NOCs. And our experience has been uh, that even when you have hot swappable power supplies, it's more important to have power conditioning and UPSs to maintain power through any power disruption. One of the most damaging things for electronics is uh, a reduction in power, not even total out but a brownout condition can seriously damage electronics. So if you can put that in there, you end up with uh, less of a need for redundancy, but redundancy is always an option. And uh, I would say that probably only a handful percent of our total installations have ever implemented a full redundancy solution because it is expensive. You're gonna double 
more than double your cost because you have to build in additional uh, switching, additional cabling, as well as additional control to handle the failover situation. And in many cases, the sources are the pieces that fail. And if they're the point of failure, then you need to look at the redundancy of those as well. All right. But great question, Corey. So, so Christian, let me turn to you as a follow-up to that um, from a redundancy perspective. Uh, what, what, do, what does Appson do in our product line for redundancy? Yeah, so uh, I shortly uh, mentioned during the time I've uh, made my explanation for the cabling. So the first option for redundancy is the data uh, redundancy within the system. So uh, I mentioned that uh, you just imagine we do have a screen with four inputs uh, or four outputs from our LED controller going to the screen. Uh, then there is, let's say, a kind of open end uh, at the last of those uh, panels. And uh, this can be connected as a loop. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, just a simple cable going back to control room uh, to a second controller so that we do have a signal loop. Means if there is a failure in the middle of a screen, uh, it gets a uh, signal from both directions one from the first controller and another from uh, the, this kind of redundant controller. Uh, but we also do have, uh, similar than Scott explained, we do have uh, a solution uh, for especially designed for control rooms where we have the option of uh, a second receiving card, which is, by the way, uh, the, the opposite of the sending card. So uh, the LED panel by itself need also to translate all um, these LED languages. Um, so we can double up, double this up uh, as well as we can have uh, double power supplies within uh, the panels. But uh, I, I fully agree with Scott. I need to love a, a little bit in between that uh, just a small percentage finally uh, goes for this uh, kind of double uh, or yeah, this uh, redundancy option due to costs. Right, right. <clears throat> Cost is always one of those things that gets in the way, isn't it? So Scott, one last question for you. You know, How do you recommend we select the processor and what, uh, what do we need to do? Make, I mean, make a list of our sources, make a list of our displays. I mean, it, it, what do you, what, what's the process like? I, I, I think you nailed it. The, the first question is usually, how many outputs do you need to drive? That's usually the first question, because that's largely going to determine uh, certainly the number of output outputs that you'll need on the processor, um, but it'll also determine the ultimate resolution of the surface that you're trying to drive, which will then help you select the appropriate uh, chassis uh, size for your solution. And then secondarily, you should look at the number and resolution of the inputs, as well as their type, whether they're baseband or uh, IP slash network uh, devices. And then when you total those up, you will be able to really nail into with, you know, some design tools, nail into the, the specific chassis that you would best be suited for your installation. And then after that, you should look at the software licensing options as what other features do you want? And uh, I think within the within our uh, quad views series line, as well as our Galileo and Zio series lines, um, you'll be able to work with our, uh, our tech services team as well as our regional sales reps to select the appropriate solution based on those criteria. We have a number of other questions we can ask about um, some of the resolution uh, that, that you'll need in your sources as well as in your uh, outputs, but you know, ultimately the quantity is what drives the, the size of the chassis. Gotcha. So we've got to do some planning. We've got to know what we're thinking about before we think about it, right? Um, so, so let's talk about the client side of, of this process of uh, selecting an LED wall and a video processor. Um, let's talk with uh, Jason a bit. Uh, from, from a consultant perspective, uh, when you specify an LED wall for a client, uh, what questions do you ask them about how they want to use the wall? Uh, those are great, great things, you know, and it, it really gets down to what we would classify as a, a needs-based assessment at that point in time. Um, which one of the key things with any needs-based assessment to start out with is understanding the group you're talking with. Um, you know, are you talking with just upper management or are you talking with uh, management, uh, technical staff and users? Because it really has frames the 
content of questions that you're going to ask on whether it's at a tech, more technical or more lighter approach. Because um, if you just ask all technical questions to a management group, you may not get the response that is needed in order to uh, design the wall appropriately or may miss uh, items within there. So then we, we you know, read the room, get to know them a little bit too, uh, understand, you know, maybe some other things within their building, other technology they use, just to, just to kind of gather some info of understanding where this group is coming from. And then we get into what, uh, what we classify as activities, understanding uh, what cases they're going to use the wall for, whether that's IMEG or presentation or digital signage, interactive collaboration, you know, the gamut, they're very, you know, we have a list of activities that we'll ask. We'll also push them a bit on uh, if they say no to a couple on asking, well, is there any of these that you see in the future that you may implement? You know, this is an investment for them and we wanna make sure we're designing something holistically for the building for a number of years, not just for the use cases that are right then and there for that for that day uh, type. So, and then uh, then we get into the content because this this plays the the big role with LED walls as, as we all know, is understanding, you know, the type of content to get on. Are they doing Excel sheets? Are they doing just, uh, PowerPoint, you know, are they doing live cameras, all of that play a role in understanding, you know, how big of a wall we actually need, or how small of a wall we actually can get away with, uh, depending on depending on that room, and then uh, ask them about precedent examples, if they've had other spaces they've been in and saw a wall they really liked, um, those are all good information as we design, you know, because there's something that they currently like, we want to go out and see what that is, you know, because that's where they got the idea that they wanted an LED wall or like it. And then also create examples they may see, something that created an emotional response from them of, wow, that was really cool. I really like what, what that one did, um, because that's really speaking to the client at that, that point in time. And then uh, we asked the, the end, uh, which is basically push them a little bit on future trends we see in the industry, just to make sure that none of those trends are something that they may go, oh, you know, we may do that in, in the future, because that plays a role in understanding uh, the design of the backbone or design of the infrastructure um, as far as uh, structural for the wall to make sure that we incorporate as much as we can for them uh, for 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Right, so you know it, it's interesting when I, when I was an integrator and a consultant. One of the things I always discussed with my customers was the fact that uh, you're going to think of a hundred new ways to use this system after I leave. So we need to plan for what some of those hundred new ways are. Um, so I, I think that's terrific. So so can you um, actually let's take a second uh, and look at the uh, poll results for sources. So it looks like we've got some pretty complex uh, environments over there. So a combination. You know, I wish there was a fourth option where we could have said uh, uh, IMEG uh, as a source that uh, Jason mentioned, because that's something that we always have to take into consideration with the refresh rate and things like that. Um, so, uh, Jason, can you describe, you know, what a typical uh, system with an LED wall looks like for you? I mean, do you are you using the multi window processors? Or are you um, what's what's a system like that look like? Yeah, so we do use multi window processors. You know, depending on what the what the client's needs are. Um, higher ed is really getting into that multi window uh, type thing with multiple content on the windows at one time. But you know, we really really start with the design side of doing a space study, which is really understanding uh, our placement options for where the wall can go. Uh, and multiple different things, studying the uh, viewing angles to the wall for uh, the viewers, you know, seeing how off side, outside out of the pattern they can get inside, you know, looking at what the closest viewer and the furthest uh, viewer is as well, because that plays a role in the size and also the uh, pixel pitch that is needed uh, for the wall, uh, depending on the content time. And then once we get through that, getting into, okay, what kind of structural, uh, limitations are we going to run into within it within the space you know what do we have to deal with structure and then uh architectural uh limits as well you know a lot of rooms you want the wall somewhere but you know there's some other idea um that the client has or other with architectural and it's basically communicating with them understanding where that can go and and then we get into the technical resources really get into the design of the wall which is you know taking those um, use cases and the content types and understanding um, 
developing that that size that's needed, that percentage of element height, uh, which is really key to it. You know, if they're if it's a conference room and we're looking at uh, Excel, well, that percentage element height uh, plays a big role for that furthest viewer away in being able to see that wall. Um, so we really study study the sizing, work with them, you know, under helping the client understand, okay, here's the ideal size. We can't get that in here. Here's how much zoom you may need to do on content in order for everybody to, to see what they're So it's setting a lot of that expectations and then um, really working on uh, marrying all of the different processing and switching that is required for it of all the different sources that may need to be within that room um, of cameras to if you got a production switcher to you know whether you're using uh, video conferencing hardware looking at all the different uh, devices that may need to plug in you know including uh, bring your own devices uh, which can be a challenge these days yeah uh, <laughs> and you know and just uh, getting those to connect up with systems um, and then you know you got a lot of different resolutions that play a uh, gamut there with uh, the bring your own devices from a phone to an iPad to you know a computer to that it's a lot of challenges in making sure uh, that all scales correctly on a video wall where a multi-image uh, window processor really helps with that uh, as we have seen uh, in making that a successful thing because it's not necessarily about filling the screen but it's about making sure that the the windows are sized appropriate for the resolution that's coming in so you you just stated something that i found very interesting you said that sometimes you actually instruct your customers to zoom in on their sources so that they get the right uh, size uh, scott is that something that uh, you can do on a source by source basis on your product oh absolutely i think the ultimate thing is with a wall processor is is flexibility you can you can scale content sizes up or down you can uh, augment the image, you can, you know, increase or decrease saturation, you can really make appropriate uh, a display for any source. Great. Great. So um, let's talk about money. Uh, everybody wants to talk about money. So um, what do you do, uh, Jason, when you have to limit the expectation of the client to match their budget? I mean, I mean, uh, how do you do that? Oh, this is the biggest challenge. Uh, <laughs> we, um, I like to put on like what we say, we become the mediator uh, of, of the project at that point in time, which is uh, if it's a brand new one, you know, you've got an architect involved, you got the owner's management uh, within there and you got the owner staff and then users. So you're trying to meet the needs of all that group from finances to use case, you know, to performance value, to all of that within they. So we kind of be the mediator and the communicator within there. And, and what we end up moving into is um, getting into that outweigh of uh, what patrons experience is going to be. So we look at like, say for the instance, percentage of patrons that have um, good sight lines versus bad sight lines and how, you know, maybe we limit, let's just say we size the wall down and just know and inform the owner that, okay, the last five rows of your uh, venue are going to start struggling a little bit on being able to see that content. Or it is we down the uh, pixel pitch of the wall and let them know, okay, so your first three to four rows may experience something of a little bit of what we call a light bright effect, uh, where you actually see, you know, the individual LEDs a little bit more, um, but it's still readable at that point in time. But it's really that expectation of that give and take of size of wall to light bright uh, effect to okay, we may have to down, for instance, the amount of sources that come into the wall uh, live at one time. So it may mean a smaller video wall processor, here's the thing, but you can add on to it uh, into the future to add more, you know, type situation. So it's, a, it's the first thing that is that give and take on the wall size and the pixel pitch. And then we really go after the uh, processing uh, next within there. And it's key throughout all of it, make sure that it's clear, clearly communicated and the owner's expectations are, uh, under you know they understand exactly what they're getting when they walk in day one and it's like oh I wasn't expecting that and sometimes it's demoing that uh, <clears throat> the differences as well uh, as we find is really key yeah that uh, expectation has to be uh, <clears throat> clear before you get to a point uh, where the where the, the product starts getting in integrated so we have a comment from uh, Dave Taylor in our chat room and uh, Dave wants Scott. He wants to come and hang out in your wine cellar. Uh, it's that's uh, 
something that you take appointments on. Um, <laughs> sure, it's right next to my home theater. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you what your favorite bottle of wine is in there, but uh, we'll leave that for another day. Yeah, um, anything on the bottom shelf, of course. <laughs> right, right. So, Jason, when working with an LED company like Epson, um, what do you need from us? Well, one of the key things is um, some design tools first for us. Um, you know, online uh, validating of, you know, we can assemble a wall on uh, online for us, you know, size it, look at the different panels and how things fit within there. Um, some of the other things that really are key is fast uh, project estimating. Sometimes we're moving very fast on things and need to get a client uh, some information or an architect, uh, some numbers uh, during a period of time. So getting some quotes back quickly uh, is, is ideal. Um, CAD and Revit files are, are kind of kind of big these days, um, you know, because we're, we're all integrating together. We're all sharing information more than we ever so uh, have in the past. Um, and uh, that architectural integration is key um, for the architect to understand how things go together, but also uh, GC and the owner. Uh, to be able to visually see some of that uh, rendering of that. And then uh, power and heat loads. Um, those are key as we're designing to make sure that uh, all, all trades and all avenues understand uh, what is needed to be provided to have that LED wall uh, implemented within there. And then I would say one of the key things with any uh, manufacturer we work with is design assistance and validation. We are not perfect. You know, we no designer can be perfect. And it's always good to get a second opinion and a second read through something just to make sure that it's correct. Um, that way, uh, when the owner gets in on day one, it's operating exactly the way that they needed and intended. Yeah, I, I think that uh, one of the things that I was very excited about when I came to work for Apps in about five months ago was the, the depth of their pre-sales engineering resources. We, we have a tremendous group of folks that are out there to do those quotations and those uh, estimates and uh, the getting the, the MEP information that you need for power, heat load, things like that. Even the, the number of lines, as we said, from the wall controller to the wall itself, we'll identify that in our initial quotation out uh, so that you can plan for conduit, number of conduits, locations of conduits, et cetera. So let's turn that around to, to um, the processing side now. Uh, working with a processing company uh, like RGB Spectrum, what, what do you need from that? Well, it's um, clearly written specs, I, I would say, is one of the key things, understanding, you know, um, the resolution capabilities of, of the boxes, you know, your input resolution, your output resolution, what can go through it, um, and then uh, clearly defined uh, what we always call in the industry gotchas, because um, there may be something within the box, if you need to set uh, four inputs to 4K60, that means just say you're downing the product, say it's an eight input box, the other four can only do four, uh, 4K uh, 30 Hertz for something is clearly understanding where the limitations are uh, within, it, within the box. You know, some once in a while you get a box that has no limitations, but um, it's really good to know as you're designing where, where are my limits with it? Where do I need to jump up to another box uh, within there? And then again, it's that design assistance and validation. Uh, we really, really rely on calling and validating, you know, making sure we clearly understand um, all the ins and outs and what's going on and our use case with the, what the owner wants to do with all of its inputs and outputs that we have read your information correctly and that um, it can be done. Yeah, again, giving you the ability to, to have a proper expectation. You specify box one, and you want it to do what box one spec sheet said it can do, right? So yep. you don't burn any surprises. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions I want to turn to uh, right now just to uh, uh, get them. Uh, well, let's do this. Let's go ahead and, and, and do our third poll. Uh, we want to know a little bit more about uh, how the content is uh, being worked on for your projects. Uh, uh, who manages your on-screen content? Is it managed locally or is it outsourced? Uh, or do you not know? So we'll give folks a few minutes to, uh, to answer that poll. Uh, we got a note here uh, online from, uh, it looks like Greg Hawes. Uh, he's mentioning that the wall load rating can be a huge factor in information that they need from us as well. That's 
that's something that we can provide. It's not on our standard quotation, but we can get our engineering team to, uh, to address that for you. Um, we also have questions from Julie Kristen in, in Dallas. Um, uh, Christian, I'll give this to you. Uh, what's the life expectancy of an Absin uh, direct view LED wall? Yeah, so, uh, so usually, uh, or the majority of products are uh, mentioned with uh, 100,000 uh, hours uh, yeah, lifetime uh, of the LEDs uh, at least. And, uh, but that also suit for, for the rest of the electronics. Uh, and this is already, let's say, quite huge uh, lifespan, isn't it? And uh, to, to get uh, this spec in the sheets right. Uh, so we speak about half of brightness after that time. So it doesn't mean that uh, the, the LEDs start to die. So it's half of brightness after 100,000 hours. So that, uh, that's quite a bit. And, and, and considering the fact that, that we're not running the LED walls at 100% at brightness, does that make that 100,000 hours extend because I'm really only using it at half brightness in normal operating conditions? Yeah, so, so th that is yeah, difficult to calculate. So, um, so the, the 100,000 hours is really uh, kind of um, yeah, first, uh, first number to consider about. And uh, then it can be even less uh, kind of uh, depending on uh, ambient uh, circumstances. So uh, for outdoor, for example, if you have uh, you know, 24 hours, 100% brightness, uh, white picture, uh, so the worst case, uh, then uh, it's, it's kind of aging the LEDs in a different way than expected because um, so LED is calculated uh, basically on video content, so not static picture for a long time or at least short term changing static picture. Uh, so that is the, the lifespan that is uh, calculated. And uh, if you stick out of that uh, system, and uh, as I said, so uh, a lot of uh, variables are responsible for the, for the lifetime. Uh, it, it's uh, humidity, it's uh, it, the brightness you mentioned, uh, it's the UV light, uh, if you speak uh, about outdoor, um, and, and can be even also uh, indoor, and uh, what about uh, the, the um, air conditioning, is it the right dimension, uh, or is, is the room in there uh, quite hot, uh, is there a glass in front of the LED, to protect the surface, uh, so uh, that, that that is a huge topic uh, to to speak about. Uh, so, but but in general, we made the experience that uh, the one hundred thousand hours fulfill the majority of cases, and that's why it's mentioned. So that so in other words, I opened a Pandora's box in asking the question. Is that what you're, you're saying? <laughs> so uh, we've got another question from Julie. Uh, she's asking about, um, are there certain manufacturers, control processors or scalers that uh, work better with apps and video walls? Well, I, I think we could start by saying that uh, we've got one of them online with us today uh, with uh, Scott from RGB, but uh, uh, Christian, do you have any other input there? Uh, no, so uh, they're, they're um... From, from LED manufacturer perspective, let's say it's, uh, we, we offer uh, the HDMI DVI input. And uh, so it's, and, and I think every uh, DVI HDMI output from, from devices are usually stable. Uh, otherwise I think market would know about uh, that, it, that it's not uh, suitable. And then, uh, yeah, there, there are plenty of, uh, and, uh, it depends on the functions. I think that is also what uh, what finally Jason is looking for uh, and customers are looking for. So uh, what are the functions behind? And that's the more important, uh, yeah, to speak about the features. And, and we, I guess, uh, yeah, or I think uh, still that we are not uh, the limitation with our LED screen. So, um... Let's see the results of our, our third poll there. We've got those ready. 
Oh, look at that. I'm surprised to see the don't know is such a high category there, 44%. We're going to be including some content discussions in our next uh, roundtable discussion. So that's why I wanted to ask this question. I think it's important to know uh, more about the content and not only where it's going to initially come from, but uh, uh, how it's going to be maintained over time. So that's a good, good question. So um, we've got a question from Jim Nelson. Uh, he wants to know about the process for establishing brightness uh, for indoors. So how, how do we determine the best brightness level for an indoor LED wall? Christian or Jason, uh, yeah. either of you have a comment there? Uh, so so uh, I would also like to, to hear uh, how Jason is, is working on that. So uh, maybe I can do the starter. Uh, so uh, for just to give an uh, idea. So at the beginning, we mentioned the apps and icon our all-in-one device, uh, which do have 350 nit. And uh, usually, um, yeah, I think a lot of people would, would think, whoa, that's, that's quite low uh, brightness. So uh, that, but it isn't. So uh, for, for that, you need to imagine you are in a, in a, a conference room uh, even that there is ambient light uh, with the, uh, through window, uh, it's uh, it's bright enough, and you need to consider that you are uh, in a conference room looking uh, onto the screen maybe the whole day, uh, and then it turns back to uh, to kind of uh, regulations which we know from monitors, so uh, it shouldn't be uh, the highest brightness. Well, uh, on the other hand, uh, if, if we go in a shopping mall or even outdoor, yes, then uh, the, the brightness need to be raised. And, uh, and, and we do have, um, let's say, automatically, according uh, the applications uh, and the suitable products within our portfolio, also you can see the different uh, brightness uh, that is offered for those products. So we have uh, sensors you can attach to the walls as well so that it can automatically adjust for time of day. Uh, so, so Jason, what, what, what's your take on that from the client side? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. I mean, there's so many variables that play a role in it, um, you know, but if you, if you take a normal space that, you know, has windows in it and, uh, you know, first, you know, it's, it's looking at A, is there dark out capability or light uh, reduction capability on those windows that, that'll play a role when, when the screen is in use? Um, understanding the architectural lighting that is in uh, in use within the room, uh, color temperature that lighting plays uh, a role in the <laughs> in the brightness. You know, not all the new uh, LED uh, architectural lighting is your friend uh, necessarily in some of the spaces uh, that we're we're doing. You know, projection or LED walls or or displays are within there. Um, but then it's uh, really looking at um, the offset of the natural light coming in the architectural lighting and looking at the foot candles um, within, within those rooms and then understanding what the contrast ratio may be on that screen uh, during, that, during that time is where we start to look at uh, how bright we really need to be. That contrast ratio plays uh, a key role in, uh, in our opinion on, on the viewability of that screen uh, with light. So, so maybe I can shortly jump in. So very nice to hear. Uh, so uh, in my mind, uh, there are more outdoor applications where the contrast ratio is, uh, is a bigger part of consideration. So um, as I'm from the technical side, uh, there are uh, so-called black face LEDs. And uh, those uh, by technology do have a lower uh, brightness. But uh, if you compare those uh, with, uh, let's say, conventional uh, LEDs being used, uh, they are sometimes better. So even with lower brightness, and this is, uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with the, uh, Jason that the contrast ratio finally uh, is, is the key for, for that as well. Great. So um, <clears throat> Scott, we have a question here that I'm not quite sure how to ask. Um, Lisa Peebler's uh, commenting and questioning, when, when should we be telling an integrator that a full 
or a more featured video wall processors required. Um, it, it, I mean, we can have maybe one input to the Novastar. As Christian said, there are some that have maybe two. Uh, the Icon product that we have has three. What, what's the breaking point when we should be recommending that the integrators think of a third party product like the RGB Spectrum? Yeah, I, I think maybe going back to what we were talking about earlier is, uh, you know, if the uh, capabilities that come with a chosen solution, whether it's the Novastar or the, or the ICOM, uh, once you exceed that quantity of images on the display based on a needs analysis, uh, or the needs analysis says that you need greater flexibility than you can get with that system without adding uh, equipment, then you need to look at adding that equipment. So, uh, you know, that can be, uh, you know, really driven, should really be driven by the intended application of the system. So if you were going to be putting that direct view LED wall uh, in a retail establishment and they need to put two different images up on there and they decide that's all they ever want to do, then by all means, you stick with that, you know, two input Novastar. But if what they want to do is they want to use it for some wayfinding, they want to do some broadcast on there, they want to do some, you know, live event streaming from other facilities, and you know, they really want to mix it up and they want the flexibility, you probably want to look at putting a processor in there. So, so again, going back to the the, the points that uh, Jason made about understanding what our customers want and mm -hmm. uh, uh, potentially even. Uh, uh, estimating what they might want in the future is part of the process that we should be in play, particularly with our system integrators. I know that, that when I was uh, a system integrator and a consultant, were, these were questions that were always there. You always had extra empty inputs so that you could add another, um, another source without having to buy a whole new card frame or a whole new chassis or expand the system. So that's all important to understand the ecosystem uh, as you're uh, designing. So, so we've got an interesting uh, question here from uh, uh, Lawrence Bickford and uh, uh, he's asking, uh, what's the best way to clean dust off and to claim 1.5 wall? So um, don't ask the housekeepers to spray it with, with uh, Lysol and, and use a rag. That's the first thing I'd say, but Christian, any suggestions? Uh, so um, it, it first of all, I think uh, you you should uh, keep in mind that every uh, chemical liquid is is not allowed for uh, for an LED surface, and uh, so it means uh, try to clean by uh, high air pressure, uh, and uh, but even there uh, you need to to pay attention. So more from my uh, private life, I know that. Uh, some of them uh, work with uh, even small oil inside. Uh, so be careful for that, uh, not using such kind of uh, devices. And um, if you, let's say, do have uh, serious uh, dirt on, so it's different than uh, the question of dust, uh, then uh, so 99.9% .9 alcohol uh, on a on a cloth, uh, so microfiber cloth uh, that that would work for such areas uh, to to clean. So if you, as that could be the next question after dust. <laughs> so um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I'm going to answer one quick question from Bruce Badger. He's asking about. Um, uh, spares and the answer to your question, Bruce, is that we include um, spares on every one of our quotations. So if you get a quote from one of our salespeople, you will have your spares on there. Um, closing thoughts, gentlemen. Uh, Jason, I'll start with you. Any uh, one last thing you want to uh, impart to our audience today? I think uh, LED walls are, you know, definitely going to become more and more prevalent here. Um, displays are, I would say, a dying um, dying breed. Uh, in it, um, partly in the fact that um, sizing is starting to matter. Um, coming out of this uh, pandemic, I think the intimacy factor um, is going to play a larger role than uh, anybody has imagined. Um, you know, right now we're all kind of intimate looking at uh, people's, you know, faces, all the rest of that. Um, I see that starting to change, uh, especially in conference rooms and other things like that, uh, more and more signals uh, on the screen at one time. Uh, to create that intimacy factor, I think is going to play a role. Um, same with live productions. I think there's going to be more and more live uh, close-up camera shots than just a single 
one IMEG uh, that is going on. Um, there, there's going to be a new onset coming out of this pandemic, and, and how we visualize things is our belief. Yeah, I think we're, we're already seeing that in some uh, market segments. Um, so, uh, uh, Christian, any uh, last words from you? Yeah, so um, in, in, in the past, as I said, I'm working in that industry already since several years. So uh, I, uh, in the past, I never considered or expected that uh, their technology can move uh, or change such fast. So, and it still happened in LED industry as well. Uh, so what I do speak about is, uh, so we have already mature LED technology out there, but uh, the technology is moving on. So there are hot topics out there, uh, like COB, like micro LED. So I think a lot of people already heard about. Uh, we also uh, follow up that trend. Uh, so, in, and as a consequence uh, or uh, as, as a reason for is uh, to get smaller pixel pitch. So we speak about, for example, 0 0.7, uh, just to make an example. So where you have uh, a smaller size screen with a still uh, or with a high resolution uh, or going for 4K resolution as a next step maybe. Um, that, that will happen uh, shortly and, and is already starting that kind of trend. And then uh, just one uh, last sentence, it's uh, also technologies like flip chip, maybe not that much heard about that, uh, but this give us opportunity also to save power uh, and, and going the step into uh, another trend, uh, which is called sustainability. And that is what we also going to take care of uh, as a manufacturer and which uh, energy saving uh, will be more and more everywhere a topic. Yeah, actually, I was hoping to get into a discussion about the lead with uh, Jason, but we're not we're not going to have enough time. So, Scott, the last word from you on on uh, on your perspective. Well, thank you. Um, I guess one one topic that didn't come up was really, you know, direct view LED versus other options. Uh, and if you're looking at building video walls, the other options are inferior for one thing that just drives me crazy. And that's mullions in the middle of an image. I hate mullions. <laughs> so, you know, the, the better the world can do by getting, you know, L direct view LED pricing down so that the direct view LEDs can, can be a better uh, price comparison with a wall built out of displays, the fewer mullions we'll see and, and I'll be a much happier person that way. Yeah, we just have to get Jason to get his customers to come up with more money. That's what, that's what we've got to do. <laughs> that's always the key, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> From my side of the table, it is. So anyway, gentlemen, thank you again very, very much for your time today. Uh, thank you, audience members. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to us. And uh, please uh, send us any questions uh, that you may have after the call, and we'll get them answered uh, via email. And then additionally, look for our next series of LED wall discussions where we'll be talking about content. So anyway, thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye -bye.